What's up, YouTube fam? This is your girl, Mrs. Tony Two Times, and we back with another video. Hey, fam. I hope this video finds you well. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of The Baltimore Way. Shout out to all of our day ones and our newest Baby. Two Times family. Thank you all so much for your support, encouraging words, and constructive criticism. Whether you agree or disagree, thank you for the time you spend watching our videos. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, I invite you to join the Two Times family. Tap that subscribe button. Hit the notification bell to get notified of all uploads. Be sure to like this video if you're rocking with the content. Comment down below and share your thoughts. Of course, always keeping it respectful. Feel free to share this video. Make sure you watch until the end to hear the full story. In this episode, we will be talking about a young pregnant mother and her daughter who lost their lives senselessly, possibly by the father of her unborn child. Let's get right into it. During the summer of 2020, Cheyenne Miller was a 23-year-old mother of one to a daughter named Shania and was expecting her second child, a boy with 24-year-old Devon Sample, who she was romantically involved with, according to reports. Cheyenne was eight months pregnant. She worked at a Pikesville nursing home, according to her mother. Cheyenne's three-year-old daughter was going to start pre-K soon and her family was preparing to throw her a baby shower. Cheyenne's mother described her as a peaceful, happy person. On Friday, June 19, 2020, a resident of the Westgate neighborhood in Southwest Baltimore left her home around 8.45 a.m. She noticed a gray Subaru sedan parked in the 200 block of Boswell with the windows down. The resident said she pulled up alongside the car and saw a woman who appeared to be asleep. She left and returned later to see the car and the woman still there. So she pulled up on the car again and blew her car horn and got no response. She proceeded to lean in towards the woman calling out, Miss, Miss, Miss. The woman remained unresponsive. At that point, she said she knew something was wrong and called 911. One emergency response vehicle arrived at the scene they discovered that the woman was wounded. A more startling discovery was a wounded toddler in the backseat of the car. Both had suffered from fatal gunshot wounds and were pronounced dead at the scene. The woman who discovered the body did not know that the little girl was in the car also. As detectives arrived at the scene, they identified the deceased woman as 23-year-old Cheyenne Miller and the little girl as her daughter, three-year-old Shania Gilmore. As police canvassed the area, they found two 9mm shell casings next to the driver's side door of Cheyenne's Subaru. An additional cartridge casing was located on the rear seat of the vehicle next to young Shania's foot, reports say. A neighbor in the Westgate community said they heard shots overnight on Thursday, but they did not investigate or call 911. They felt terrible about the bad series of events, but said, unfortunately, they feel their attempts would not have changed what had already happened. The incident was unnerving for the tight-knit community. The victim's family were stunned by their devastating loss. They gathered outside their home to remember and mourn Cheyenne and Shania. Cheyenne's mother said that their daughter wanted peace. She wanted to be loved. She wanted everyone to love her. 
Her mother cannot imagine who would want to do anything to her. Her three-year-old granddaughter would have been starting preschool soon, and she was excited about the arrival of her grandson. But now, their bright future was overshadowed with grief. Cheyenne's mother and family members pleaded with investigators to find the person who took their loved one's lives. As the investigation continued, detectives came across surveillance cameras in the area of the crime scene. According to the police report, the recovered footage from Thursday, June 18, 2020, showed that at approximately 10.59 p.m., two vehicles, Cheyenne Subaru and a black BMW SUV, were driving southbound in the 200 block of Boswell Avenue. The black SUV is seen pulling into the block, followed by Cheyenne Miller's Subaru. Cheyenne's gray Subaru legacy is seen pulling on the side of the road. The occupant of the black BMW X6 exits the car and stands at the driver's side, then over to the passenger's side and repeats it again. The footage shows a first muzzle flash at 11.06 p.m. and then a second and third muzzle flash at 11.07 within seconds of each other. Then the occupant of the black BMW gets back into the SUV, leaves, and heads southbound towards Frederick Avenue. While Cheyenne's car stayed at the scene, the gunshots heard seemed to be consistent with residents' testimony. Now detectives had to find out who the black BMW SUV belonged to, who was driving it, and a motive to the horrendous crime. Officers found out that the BMW SUV was registered to none other than Devon Sample, Cheyenne's unborn child's father. They went to the Melbourne Road address where the car was registered to, to locate and speak to Devon. Upon arrival, Devon's grandmother answered the door. According to police reports, when police asked her where Mr. Sample was, she said he wasn't home. His grandmother also told police that Cheyenne and her daughter Shania were at the home the evening of June 18th, 2020 at around 7 o'clock p.m. Officers then told her that a search warrant was pending. That's when she told officers that Devon was on the second floor of the house. Devon Sample was detained by police and transported to the police department to be interviewed in relation to the incident. While at Devon's residence, police say they noticed his black BMW SUV parked in the block in close proximity to his residence. According to the police report, Devon was read his Miranda rights. He waived his rights and agreed to speak to detectives. When Devon was interviewed by officers, he initially denied being present at the scene. According to reports, when confronted with the video footage showing the fact that his car was seen in the area of the crime scene, he admitted to driving the black BMW on the date and time of the incident. Reports also say that he told officers he was parked in front of Cheyenne's car, entered into the front passenger seat with Cheyenne in the front driver's seat and young Shania in the back seat, which officers say corroborates the video footage recovered as well as physical evidence recovered from the scene. However, the police reports say that Devon claimed he got into his car, left the area, and never saw the victims again.
the Vaughn sample remained held at the Baltimore Central Booking and Intake Center until his bail hearing. He was charged with 16 counts ranging from first degree murder to committing a crime of violence on a pregnant person. Devon had already had a pending case in Baltimore County involving a traffic stop while driving Cheyenne's car a month earlier, but no other criminal record. At his bail hearing, on the 22nd of June, 2020, his public defender proclaimed his innocence. With the arrest, the family and friends of Cheyenne Miller and Shania Gilmore were relieved. Although they couldn't wrap their heads around how this could have happened. Some believe there may have been tension between Cheyenne and Devon, but maybe not to the extent of the alleged crime. On September 27, 2021, prosecutors presented a plea to Devon requiring him to plead guilty to the indictment, offering him life without parole. Devon and his defense attorney rejected the plea offer. According to court records, his trial has been scheduled for March 21, 2022. He is innocent until proven guilty. Rest in peace to Cheyenne, Shania, and her unborn son. My sincerest and deepest condolences to their families and loved ones. I hope that the past two years brought some type of peace and comfort to them. These senseless acts of violence against women and children seem to be at an all-time high. Femicide is on the rise with all the news reports of women dying at the hands of men, particularly the ones they are having babies with or are in relationships with. It's really scary and sad. Our men are supposed to provide protection for us women, not dispose of us and our offspring. What could be the underlying reason for these types of fatal attractions? Let me know what you think in the comments down below. All right, fam, thank you all for watching and making it until the end of this video. If you'd like, please give us a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. Don't forget to set your notifications to get notified of all uploads. Thanks again for watching. This is your girl, Mrs. Tony Two Times, and I'm out. What's going on, YouTube? Fine, this your boy Tony Two Times, and we back with another episode of the Baltimore Way, man. Before I start, y'all know what I need y'all to do. Be sure to hit that like button, share the video with your peoples, and definitely watch it to the end. Let's get right into it. When we are young and trying to have fun, it oftentimes leads to us agreeing to certain things, not really understanding the consequences if things go wrong. And when younger people hang in the older circle, depending on the mindset, it usually leads to the younger person being manipulated. And on this episode of The Baltimore Way, we will be discussing three young men, Adonye Dixon, John Childs, and at the time, 14-year-old Rayshawn Rivers, and the plot they hit a fast lick that went left, leading to a young lady being gone. Allegedly, it all started on June 6, 2015, with the three men, and at the time, 16-year-old Arnisha Bowers were attending a party at an apartment building where two of the young men were living at at the time. A little after 11 p.m., Ms. Bowers and her friend were picked up from the party by Anisha's grandmother, who took her home before then leaving to go to work. Going into the late night, Somehow the three young men decided to call the young lady, telling the younger Rayshawn, tell Miss Bowers you want to come chill with her, and while y'all are in the room, we will hit the house and take items. Rayshawn agreed, and then the three headed to the young lady's house after midnight on June 7th in the 6100 block of Eastern Parkway. But as the young lady thought she would just be chilling with a classmate, 
Rayshawn, she noticed the two older guys and felt something wasn't right. And the young lady left her room to see Childs and Dixon in her living room. This is where things go left. Allegedly, Mr. Dixon went to the kitchen to retrieve something and handed it to Mr. Childs and told him to do something. While the younger Rayshawn watched as they ransacked the home, taking cell phones, money, and other items. Before Childs allegedly took the young lady to the basement and doing certain acts and eventually leaving Audisha gone. Soon after, the three decided to set blazes all over the home. But neighbors heard Doug's barking and discovered the flames in the early morning hours before calling 911. As authorities approached and entered the home, they quickly realized it was a crime scene after finding the victim. After investigation, BPD quickly linked the three men to the crime, charging John Childs with first degree hit, conspiracy, home invasion, and other more crazier charges. Being that Childs was the alleged person responsible for the hit, he was found guilty and received three concurrent life sentences. Adonye Dixon pled guilty to first degree hit, conspiracy, and other charges and was sentenced to life, all suspended but 50 years. The younger man, Rayshawn's involvement was questioned by prosecutors as his lawyers discussed his age at the time and that the two other men was much older and Rayshawn was manipulated, thinking it would just be a simple lick and this wouldn't happen to his friend, Arnisha. But it would be the testimony of Dixon at both of his co-defendants trials that made the younger Rayshawn get a break. As prosecutors heard that Childs was the aggressor and Rayshawn was scared and couldn't do anything about it. Rayshawn was sentenced to 15 years, all suspended but five years. As prosecutors alleged, the young man still knew what they was about to do and knew it was wrong, but they couldn't prove he knew what was about to happen. Rest in peace to all Nisha. I send my prayers and condolences to the family. More of this story, watch the company you keep. I'm not sure if Rayshawn and Arnisha were just friends or more, but he let someone else ideas lead to his friend being gone. That's what you call being a follower. The two other men threw their lives away for cell phones and a few dollars and turned on each other in court. But hey, that's the Baltimore way. Man, crazy story, you feel me? First and foremost, rest in peace to the young lady. You know what I mean? This was senseless, you feel me? But it's crazy because Shorty was young. He was only 14 at the time. so. He hanging with these older dudes. They just coming from a party. So, you know what I mean? Somehow during the party, they decided that they was gonna go to Arnisha's home when her grandma went to work and take a few items and get up out of there. But of course, things ain't go that way. I don't know how they knew the young lady was gonna be home alone. Maybe she told the young man, you feel me, Rayshawn, because he was 14. He was in her age bracket. I think they knew each other from around the way or at school. So maybe she told him, not knowing he was gonna bring the other two, you feel me? But when they came and the two younger kids was chilling in the room, you feel me, Rayshawn and Arnisha, she heard the other two in the living room. And that's when she came out and that's when things went left. You know what I mean? I ain't say all the details cause it's a lot of stuff that's crazy, but the situation real messed up, you feel me, what they did. And at the end of the day, you feel me? Shorty got a second chance out here because they couldn't prove that he knew what was about to happen. All they knew is he was with them, he was much younger, and he wasn't the aggressor on nothing that happened to her. But they was trying to paint a picture like he set the thing up, but he ended up making out and he ended up getting a second chance at life. For the other two, they, they gone. One of them got life, the other one got 50 years. You feel me? And it's just senseless, you know what I mean? I know her grandmother was sick. You go to work, you thinking, you leaving your granddaughter home to go to sleep, and this happened, you feel me? All because at a party, they decided they wanted to make a few couple dollars. And I don't know what people be thinking, man. I don't know how much money people be thinking people got or what they thought was in the house, you feel me? At the most, you might get a few TVs, some jewelry, a couple dollars, but it ain't enough to throw your whole life away, man. But that's how it be, man. Real messed up story, you feel me? I definitely send my prayers and condolences to her family. You know what I mean? Young lady had a whole life ahead of her, man. But yeah, y'all already know, man. This is another episode of The Baltimore Way. I appreciate it if you made it to the end. It's your boy Tony two times. Y'all already know it's all love, fam. I'm out of here.
times and we back with another episode of the Baltimore Way, man. Before I get started, be sure to smash that like button. Definitely watch the video to the end to hear the full story. Subscribe if you're new to the fam. Hit that notification bell for future uploads. Okay, before I get started, a little disclaimer. The two victims that lost their life, rest in peace. They not here to tell their side of the story. So yeah, let's get right into it. Hustling can be a dangerous game in itself, but doing a deal to get weight or product to sell is even more dangerous because you never know when someone is gonna try to pull a move. And that's when things get wild. And on this episode of the Baltimore Way, we will discuss a case involving two brothers and a $25,000 deal that left two men gone. According to sources, when a young man we will call Jay was trying to make some extra money, he often tried to sell grass or play the middle man and set up deals. Renting a room in an apartment at a friend's house in Towson, Jay would get a call in April 2018 from a man he knew for a minute, Stanley Brunson. Stanley allegedly wanted to buy 21 pounds of grass from Jay. Not having that kind of weight, Jay called the man he had met at a bar in Fells Point, Norwood Johnson, who Jay had saved his name as his nickname, Knuckles. Norwood also had a little brother, Najee Johnson. For a few days, Jay and the brothers text back and forth. Jay also communicated with Stanley, letting him know the price of the pounds, which they came up with a ticket of $25,000. Finally, with everything set up, everyone agreed to meet on the morning of April 8th, 2018, at the Towson apartment. Jay's landlord had dipped out with his girlfriend, but it was a young lady visiting Jay his friend and Morgan State basketball star, Tracy Carrollton, who was in a separate room. Stanley arrived at the spot at about 11 a.m. with his homeboy, Shamik Joyner. Jay went to meet the men in the lobby and brought them upstairs. Then a text came in from Norwood stating traffic, meaning the two brothers were on their way, even sending Jay a picture showing slow moving traffic on Interstate 695. Surveillance in the area picked up a black BMW with the two brothers in it, registered to Norwood, entering the parking lot of the apartment at about 11.21 a.m. Allegedly, when the brothers arrived, they came all business, took the duffel bag out the car and showed Jay the grass before going upstairs in the apartment where the buyer, Stanley, and his homie Shamit was at. This is where things get crazy. According to Jay and later court testimonies, Stanley asked Jay, so everything good? In which he stated, yes, as Norwood placed a duffel bag on the ottoman in the living room and let Stanley check out the weight. Then allegedly, Shamit came from behind and put a blick to Jay's head. Jay reacted by pushing Shamit back against the wall and pressing his forearm on his neck before screaming out to Stanley, yo, what your boy doing? Then according to Jay's statement, that's when he heard shots go off and felt Shamit's body go limp and hit the floor. Then he looked over to the living room and saw Stanley get hit and fall as well. Jay testified he closed his eyes in fear, and when he opened them back up, the brothers and the duffel bag was gone. A resident in the building testified she heard three bursts of gunshots on the morning of April 8th, and she looked at the time, it was 11.23 a.m. Surveillance video showed Norwood's BMW left the parking lot at 11.30 a.m. After everyone was gone, Jay ran to the bedroom to get the young lady, Tracy, and the two headed outside. Jay alleged he saw someone he knew and hopped in a whip, but then he realized he left his wallet in the apartment. Surveillance showed Jay running back in the building at 11.43 a.m., and he told authorities, even though Stanley was shot several times, when he walked past the man to get his wallet, Jay stated Stanley started making threats and stated he was going to get him. Jay alleged he walked to the kitchen to get a blade, and then Stanley lunged towards him. That's when he started poking him until he was down. The next day, maintenance workers at the apartment found Stanley's and Shamik's bodies inside the apartment. Ballistics later showed the men had been shot with two different blicks, one 40 caliber, 45 caliber, and nine millimeter bullets was all over the apartment, but the knife or no blicks were found. Autopsy of the two men showed Shamik passed away from three wounds to his back and side. As for Stanley, seven wounds and 36 shot force marks. On April 12th, four days after the hits, 
A detective located Norwood's black BMW at a friend's house, parked on Elton Avenue in Baltimore County. Police alleged Norwood got in the car, looked around before walking into the home, and then driving away in another whip with his little brother, Najee, in the car with him. The home was where Norwood's best friend and girlfriend lived, and police hit the house with a search warrant and allegedly found 21 pounds of grass vacuum sealed. They locked up Norwood's home. The two brothers were eventually picked up and charged with conspiracy to distribute grass, two murder charges, and firearm charges. While awaiting trial, a messed up situation would happen. As the young lady Tracy Carrington, Jay's homegirl and Morgan State basketball star that was in the Towson apartment that day when everything took place, the young lady was leaving SNS Lounge in the 6900 block of Bel Air Road with a friend when a masked gunman ran up and hit her multiple times, leaving Tracy gone on the scene. Baltimore County Police investigated the shooting as a targeted hit because Tracy's friend wasn't hit, it was only just her. So it wasn't a robbery and the person just shot and ran. Even though Tracy was said to be a witness to the Towson double murders and was supposed to testify, police in the state never connected her passing with the Johnson brothers case. Eventually, Norwood and Najee were both found guilty on conspiracy to distribute grass and second degree hits. They were tried together and both received two 20 year consecutive sentences for the two hits. So in total, 40 years apiece. With surveillance and witnesses, it was an open and shut case. As for Jay, I don't think he was ever charged. If so, it must have been sealed. Rest in peace to Stanley, Shamit, and Tracy. I send my prayers and condolences to the families. More of this story, fast money is always good when everything is going right. But if that one day things get ugly, it can have you gone or doing 40 years in prison. But hey, that's the Baltimore way. Man, it's a messed up story, you feel me? All around the board, like I said, rest in peace to Stanley and Shamit, you feel me? They ain't here to tell their story, you know? So Jay, you feel me, the brother's homeboy, he told his side of the story and he said what happened and he alleged that Shamik and them started everything, you feel me? So I don't know if they were trying to hit a lick or something like that, you know, but like I say, they can't talk, they ain't here to defend themselves. But the brothers allegedly came to make a play. They came to make some money with the 21 pounds cause Jay ain't have it and things got out of hand, man. So anything could have happened, you feel me? In that apartment, as far as the young lady, who lost her life, man. That was crazy, you feel me? But they say they have nothing to do with the case. They say that was a separate incident. I'm not even sure if somebody got caught for that or not, but that was messed up as well, you feel me? She was a Morgan State basketball star, young lady, 25 years old. But yeah, it be like that, man. This case was crazy all around the board. It's a lot of elements to this story. Let me know what y'all think in the comments. Definitely let me know about this one. Be sure to smash that like button. I appreciate you if you made it to the end. It's your boy Tony two times. Love fam. I'm out. This video finds you well. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of The Baltimore Way. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, I invite you to join the Two Times family. Tap that subscribe button. Hit the notification bell to get notified of all uploads. Be sure to like this video if you're rocking with the content. Comment down below and share your thoughts. Of course, always keeping it respectful. Feel free to share this video. Make sure you watch until the end to hear the full story. In this episode, I will be telling the story of three healthcare professionals whose lives tragically ended as the suspect shared what he had done on social media. So let's get right into it. On Saturday, December 11th, 2021, Baltimore Police Department's Southern District Station got a call around 1.30 p.m. about a residential alarm in the 1500 block of Marshall Street. Officers found the door kicked in and inside the home, they discovered 41-year-old Tara LeBang shot to death. Detectives arrived and learned that a neighbor said her ring security camera picked up the sound of six rounds of fire. 
Who was Tara LeBang and why did this happen to her? Tara LeBang worked at the Ascension St. Agnes Hospital as a certified registered nurse anesthesiologist. She assisted in administering the proper doses of anesthesia for surgeries and other procedures such as epidurals. She also worked at University of Maryland Capital Regional Health and another area hospital. Her goal was to ultimately find a permanent fit. It was obvious that Tara loved what she was doing for a living. Not only did she make an impact in her patients' lives, but also her colleagues. One of her coworkers who worked with her in the operating room described her as a hard worker. She was fun to be around. She had this smile and this energy about her. When she was happy, you were happy, they said. So who could have done this to Tara? Investigators didn't have to wait long to find out. Shortly thereafter, Baltimore investigators learned about a live video on social media in which the suspect described his intent to commit another homicide in Colombia after what he had done to Tara. The suspect was Tara LeBang's ex-boyfriend, 44-year-old Rajay Black, who, according to his social media, was also working as a nurse anesthesiologist. Officials said he forced his way into Tara's Federal Hill home and took her life before going live on Facebook to reveal what he had done and what he was about to do next. The Facebook Live video he started on Saturday afternoon was apparently taken outside of an apartment building in Columbia, just outside of Baltimore. Rajay said he was upset about issues with two women, one being Tara and the other, his ex-wife, 42-year-old Wendy Black of Howard County, who also worked as a nurse anesthesiologist at the county's general hospital. Wendy and Rajay had two young children together. Rajay went on to say this in the live video. Anyway, I just did something crazy, man. I just shot my ex-girlfriend in the head, he says. Felt like a dream. Crazy. I never thought I would be that guy. I can't go to prison, so the person that really started my depression in all of this is my ex-wife. So she next then I'm going to do myself too. At that moment, his ex-wife opened the door. Oh, there's my ex-wife right now, he says, as the video cuts. After BPD discovered the video on social media, they immediately contacted Howard County officials to notify them. Officials in Howard County had been dispatched around 2.08 p.m. for shots fired in the 7300 block of Edenbrook Drive in Columbia, sources said. When they arrived at 2.14 p.m., they found two people unalive in the entrance hall of an apartment building located in the Madison at Edenbrook Apartments. Howard County officers got a call from their counterparts in Baltimore around 2.22 p.m. about the video, sources said. But sadly, the warning came too late. The deceased woman was identified as Wendy Black and the man was identified as Rajay Black. It was apparent that Rajay had followed through on his disturbing plan to take his ex-wife's life and then his own. The Facebook video was reposted to Twitter by a woman who wrote that she was friends with Rajay. The apartment building number visible in the video was the same that Howard County Police had blocked off after responding to the 911 call. Howard County officials said that the Black's two young children were inside Rajay's gray BMW while the horrendous acts occurred, but they were found safe and unharmed. What could have caused Rajay Black to do these horrific things? 
According to sources, court records showed a lengthy custody battle between him and Wendy Black that was unfolding for three years. Records also show a history of DV charges, but does not show who actually filed the charges. Rajay had held a position as a nurse anesthesiologist at the VA hospital since June of 2020. Sources revealed that on his LinkedIn profile, Rajay Black also previously worked for the University of Maryland Capital Region Health for about three and a half years, the same place where Tara had worked. Sources say court records also showed Rajay Black filed a federal lawsuit against University of Maryland Medical System in January 2021, claiming he had been wrongfully fired after he exposed a doctor who allegedly was stashing drugs in his locker. UMMS declined to comment on the case because the litigation was still pending at the time. Could the loss of a job, relationship, a pending custody battle, the stresses that came with adjusting to life during a pandemic been the breaking point? Did Rajay's Black's history of DV and mental health issues go unchecked? We probably are asking ourselves, could this situation have had a different outcome? Tara LeBang was loved in her field of work and the community around it. She got into a relationship with Rajay, not knowing he would be the one to viciously end her life. Rajay's ex-wife, Wendy Black, was more than likely trying to adjust to life as a single mother and trying to come to a co-parenting agreement with her children's father. Something clearly caused Rajay to have a psychotic break, which led him to do what he did. DV combined with mental health issues is a potential recipe for disaster. It's nothing to play with. Seek help, notice the signs. If you're not aware of the signs, research what they are with all the information that is out there. I'm praying for you if you are or have gone through this. These past two years have been a trying time for many. It hasn't been easy for a lot of us. Many of us are still just taking things day by day. I hope and pray for everyone to find the healing that they so desperately need. Rest in peace to Tara LeBang and her unborn baby and Wendy Black. My sincerest and deepest condolences to their family and loved ones. I can't fathom their pain and I hope with time they can find some kind of peace and joy. My condolences also to Rajay's Black's family. Despite my feelings towards his terrible actions, he was still loved by someone and both his children lost their parents. I'm also sure his mental health issues played a part in this terrible, terrible incident. Nevertheless, I pray for all who were affected by this horrific event. All right, fam, tell me what you think about this story in the comments below. I would love to hear your thoughts and opinions if you have any. Thank you all so much for watching. Please like this video if you're rocking with us. It helps with the algorithm. Subscribe if you haven't already. Don't forget to share this video if you'd like. This is your girl, Mrs. Tony Two Times, and I'm out. This your boy, Tony Two Times, and we back with another episode of the Baltimore Way, man. Before I start, be sure to like, comment, definitely share the video with your peoples and watch to the end. Let's get right into it. Having kids is a blessing. Bringing a life into this world can sometimes bring the best out of a person, helping them change their ways to see what is more important in life. But in some cases, the child's mother and father could go from lovers and friends to enemies real quick. Rather it's beef about child support, visitation, or feeling betrayed when someone new comes in the picture and is around your child. 
It's all things that can be worked out with a little communication and patience. But some people choose other options that can turn a messy situation to a fatal one. And on this episode of the Baltimore Way, we will be discussing the situation of a young lady, her baby father, and her new boyfriend that left one person gone. When Robert Holiday went to his baby mother's house to visit his child, the woman at the time, 24-year-old LaQuisha Lewis, for one reason or another, got upset according to sources. The parents would get into a verbal altercation that turned the little physical before Robert decided to just leave. But that was just the beginning, little did he know. At the time, Robert was living in East Baltimore and Miss Lewis was living in Essex, Baltimore County. The young mother had moved on to a new boyfriend, 22-year-old Michael Martin. Allegedly after Robert left the home, Miss Lewis was still frustrated. She was sending threatening text messages to him telling her child's father his life was coming to an end. Before eventually calling Robert, having a conversation to see where he would be at later that night. The phone conversation was about 40 minutes, but little did Robert know, thinking he was just talking to his angry baby mother, but Miss Lewis had other plans in mind. Texting her boyfriend and his little brother every move Robert told her he was making that day and baking a cake for a plot to get her baby father out the way. The two brothers, both from PG County, Maryland, later that night got the drop on Robert and where he was at with two of his friends. The brothers hopped in the whip and put the plan in motion. Pulling up by a bus stop on Eastern Boulevard, allegedly the two brothers got out of the car, letting off shots at Robert and his friends. Striking all three people, but Robert would unfortunately not make it. As far as the other two victims, they survived. The two brothers fled the scene but BPD would start an investigation and a search and seizure warrant that recovered ballistic evidence and more that linked the two brothers to the crime scene. And as the investigation continued, linking Ms. Lewis as the alleged mastermind responsible for the whole thing. All three were eventually arrested and charged with the hit on Robert and the two attempts on his friends. As the case went on to trial, prosecutors painted a picture of an angry Ms. Lewis that played her new boyfriend against her baby father. She would later be found guilty of the hit and sentenced to life in prison. As for Michael Martin, the boyfriend, he would be found guilty of the hit, conspiracy to commit a hit, and the blicky charge. He was sentenced to two consecutive life sentences plus 20 years. As for his little brother, Michael Martin, he was convicted as well. More of this story, baby mother and baby father drama is a normal thing. When you love your kid, feelings get involved, and most of the time, both parents feel like they are right for whatever reason in the situation. But don't let a 15 minute angry decision leave your child without either parents and you doing life in prison. Let the anger go down and see if you feel the same way before making a call that could be fatal. But hey, that's the Baltimore way. Man, crazy story, you feel me? As we all know, you know what I mean? I'd have been in this situation, you feel me? We all got kids, most of us. And a lot of times, man, the people you think you're going to be with or the person you have a kid with, it don't usually go that way. And for whatever reason, it be drama. You can be the best parent in the world, but it be drama because it still be love there. It be animosity if you move on with your life. It be animosity if you ain't doing enough, you feel me? Or just if you is doing a lot, but you got a new person in the picture. So it get crazy like that. But in this case, you know, Robert, he went to see his child, you know, for whatever reason, they got into an argument. Like I said, it could have been about anything. And you know, it turned a little crazy. And at the time she had moved on, she was dealing with a new dude, you know. And a lot of times, I ain't saying it's the case, but some women are paint a narrative to the new dude to make you sound horrible, to make you sound like you be beating on them or you be doing a lot of crazy things or you just a deadbeat. So they already in their mind got this thing about you. They already don't like you for whatever reason. They already feel like you ain't nothing, you feel me? You know what I mean? And they turn crazy because the more they feed that into their mind, the more they become not liking you instead of getting the story for themselves. And then what she did, she called Robert to try to like play it off like everything was cool to see what he was doing, to see where he was at. And somehow they got the drop. Whole time she was texting her new boyfriend and his little brother, letting them know where him and his people was at, which is real messed up. 
because at the end of the day, I don't know if she was thinking out of anger, but if they go do this, which they did, this gonna leave your child without a father, you feel me? So she sent them to do what they did, you feel me? They pulled up and they did them. You know, rest in peace to the man who lost their life and uh, you know, the other people that got hit, they survived, but that's still unfortunate. And the thing is, he probably ain't no shorty that long. Dude who was her boyfriend probably ain't know her that long. He got caught up in this situation. He let his emotions get the best of him, his pride or whatever, and he sent himself off. He sent himself on a dummy mission. He crashed out for a female, you feel me? Thinking he was protecting the day, and you caught a body. Now you got two life sentences, you know what I mean? At 20 some years old, you threw your whole life away. And then, like I said, she locked up for life. The child's father, he gone. So it's an all around messed up situation. Don't nobody win in this situation, man. And I know a lot of us got baby fathers and baby mothers we can't stand, you feel me? But it ain't worth that, you feel me? The best thing you can do is be successful, take care of your kid and kill him with kindness, you know what I mean? Anytime they try to get mad, you be the bigger man or woman, you feel me? You turn the other cheek and you just keep it about your child. Cause when other issues get involved, that's when feelings get involved and people get crazy. But yeah, man, y'all already know this is another episode of the Baltimore Way. Be sure to like, comment, share. I love y'all fam. I'm out.